great to have you here to introduce you. you I think you, have been, uh, you were born in Hyderabad. Right. You have an education in computer science and in business, uh, an MBA of uh, Chicago That's Business right. School, and you joined um, um, Microsoft in 92. That's Is right. that correct? That's yeah. correct. And now you are the CEO after a career inside the company you are the CEO since uh, 2014. That's correct. Yeah. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion about data here during the meeting. Um, and data is becoming, in some ways, the oxygen for uh, new products and services. And of course, uh, those technologies uh, have the promise of uh, creating innovative solutions to some of the biggest challenges we have in the world. Um, but at the end, personal data is collected or is in the hands, if I, some people would say, of some very few uh, platform uh, companies. And uh, we have seen maybe less during this meeting, but if you look at the media, a backlash against those companies. Um, and uh, how do we really balance uh, privacy um, uh, and how, how do we ensure that this data collection serves public goods and not just selfish um, commercial interests of some companies? First of all, Professor uh, Schwab, thank you so much uh, for having me here. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, at a time when uh, a lot of change is happening for you to be able to convene a forum like this to have the tough discussions uh, around what global norms are needed uh, on tough issues. Uh, the one you, you brought up on data is absolutely paramount. If you think about it, one of the things uh, that is going to happen in the fourth industrial revolution is data and digital technology is the new factor of production. Uh, whether you're in retail, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in insurance, any sector of our economy, any walk of our lives is going to be driven by digital and data. So I think just like electricity was democratized, it was available, it fueled economic growth and productivity growth in the previous industrial revolution, the same thing needs to happen with data. So for example, at Microsoft, as a platform company, I actually think of my job and our company's identity is to not create a dependence on Microsoft. If anything, we want to partner with companies in every country, in every region, so that they can create independence for themselves in an era of digital technology. Of course, that also means that each of us has to operate as companies in the tech sector. But interestingly enough, what is the tech sector? The world is a tech sector. So in some sense, every health company, every retail company going forward also will need to think of data and really make sure that we all adhere to this core principle of data as a human right and privacy as a human right. And that's at least the world I envision. Do you see at the moment the uh, so privacy is sufficiently protected or is there still a long way to go? I think that we have the right start. If you even think about the change in the last year with GDPR, there is a complete new realization of how important it is for all of us to really say that we have to start from the core principle yeah. that the user is in control of their data. They are the owners of the data. Mm -hmm. if Ever, a company like us should be a custodian of their data that is earned by the trust of the user. So that, to me, is the transformation. We are in the very beginning phase of understanding it. But interestingly enough, it's just not the tech sector who needs to understand it. Everyone across the economy needs to understand that. And so it's different behavior in the tech se sector at the moment. Hey, that's actually a good one, because in some sense, if you look at it, right, you know, all of us, somebody explained this to me, you know, we're all defined by our business models. There are even, there is no such thing as the tech sector. Uh, even in the tech companies, we come in two different flavors. There are people who are, like us, primarily focused on providing technology and creating technology so that others can create more technology. 
that's what I describe as the platform company. In fact, there's, mm-hmm. it's called the Bill Gates line, which uh-huh. is in a, pl- a true platform company really has the following attribute, which is you build a platform, there is more surplus, more value that is created above the platform. That's what defines a platform company. And wow. non-platform companies, which are also, you know, w- you know, have a place under the sun, they're more aggregator uh, businesses. So the fact that we lump what are aggregation businesses and platform businesses and give them the same sobriquet of a platform company, I think we need to now start really separating these two out. Satya, you were one of the first partners of our Center for the First Industrial Revolution. And the idea behind is actually that um, the traditional ways of setting standards and uh, to create ethical rules, um, governments creating frameworks and afterwards businesses following it, don't work anymore. You mm-hmm. need permanent exchange cooperation. Um, but uh, governments have sometimes difficulties to understand what's really going on. How, um, what, what would you recommend to, to, to make sure that governments move out of this always too late zone? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough issue because in some sense, I start from the point of view that it's so important to have institutions that govern us. Uh, because it's not that we can somehow do away with what governments have always done, what we have had as even global norms are so important. But at the same time, I think we as individual companies, to your point, cannot abdicate our responsibility. So for, take even something that we recently called for we're around uh, facial recognition. Facial recognition is a piece of technology. It's just going to be democratized. It's going to be prevalent. I can come up with 10 cases which are very virtuous and important that can improve human life. I can come up with 10 issues that are going to cause you know, real challenges. So one of the things that I feel today is in the marketplace, there's competition. There is no discrimination between the right use and the wrong use of facial recognition. So we as company, for example, at Microsoft, we've said we are going to have a set of principles that we will use to both build it and make sure that there's fair and robust use of this technology and not any of the unintended consequences. So I'll call it self-regulation. But at the same time, we also welcome any regulation that helps the marketplace not be a race to the bottom. Because if you turn it to just a private enterprise, what happens in many times is that we will have a race to the bottom and then we will have to come back and deal with the bad consequences with even more heavy handed regulatory regimes and so on. So that understanding is what I think, or the sophistication is what's required. One attempt to go into this direction is the European approach of the GDPR. Um, Now, some people say it's already outdated. Uh, Some people say it should become uh, a norm on a global level. What is your your, uh, opinion? My view on GDPR is for all, 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 forever we're always going to have this issue, which is anything that is a norm today or a standard today, we'll have to continuously evolve as technology evolves. But that said, my own uh, point of view on GDPR is it's a fantastic start. Uh, on really treating uh, privacy as a human right. I am hopeful that even in the United States, we will have something that is along the same lines. In fact, I would hope that the world over, we all converge on a common standard because one of the things we do not want to do is to fragment the world uh, and increase transaction costs because ultimately it's going to be born in our economic figures. So therefore, I hope that we really come together, United States and Europe first and China, all the three uh, regions will have to come together and set a global standard because that's what's going to help. By the way, most people think of this as some conflict between regions. It's not. In a digital world, for, of course, every country should put their country's interests, every region should put their interests first. But the digital world will help all of us grow if we realize that it's a connected world to start with. Now, if uh, we, we take a, we look at the black box algorithm, as some people say, uh, of artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, when we do not know uh, really what the result is coming out, uh, how do we ensure that the result is ethical? Yeah. 
because it's, uh, it's the norms is one issue, but let's say ethical rules is the other issue. I mean, this is, first of all, again, just like in privacy, there are certain principles. I actually start in AI by saying, as creators of AI, we need to have some principles that govern AI. Uh, we have, in our own case, we have said, okay, you know, when I trace back even at Microsoft's history, 20 years ago, we started the journey of saying, how do we build software that's secure by design, right? We had to really do a lot of re-engineering of our processes, teaching of our own engineers on what does it mean to do threat modeling in software so that we build more robust software. Same thing with AI. Uh, we have to have design principles. How, what does it mean to have fairness? What does it mean to have robustness? Take something that you create. How do you know that the use case for which it's being used, you've actually got robustness in it? Uh, privacy and security. Yeah. How do we make sure that there's accountability? But one of the things is there's even a state-of-the-art challenge in AI, which is, it, as you described it, sometimes there's a black box. Yeah. Uh, because it's being trained by data, it's not being programmed. In other words, the programs are being written by data. But there are new approaches coming out of research. For example, there's this entire field of counterfactual reasoning of what the black box does. And that's the, for example, I would say something like that will be used for, say, if somebody is making a decision on whom to give a loan or not a loan, there are actual laws and rules around it so that there's no bias. So there will be breakthroughs in AI that help us explain the back blocks so that ethically and regulatory-wise we can control it. But if we take, let's say, ethics and we look at the world, we have not only today a, we have a multipolar world, but we have also a multi-conceptual world. Mm -hmm. So um, ethics which come out of cultural backgrounds may differ uh, in different regions of the world. Just look at China and the US. How do we, you are a global company, how do you accommodate uh, in a world of different cultures and different, I would say, even ethical principles. I mean, it's a, I would say this is kind of one of the things that we say. It's not as if we all got up in 2019 and discovered the complexity of the world. Uh, this has happened throughout our sort of history, that the world has been complicated. If anything, sometimes, I think, in the digital world, we have made naive assumptions uh, that there is uniformity, or not recognizing, I think, the legitimate needs people have for their cultural identities, their different approaches, their different priorities. So at least the way I look at it, uh, Professor Schwab, is that we as an industry and we as a world need to recognize both the need for diversity, but at the same time some global norms on key things that we are prioritizing. Yeah. In fact, if you think about the last phase of globalization, which today we criticize for certain impacts it has had, the one thing it did achieve was some real rules and frameworks and global norms. We clearly understand that there were some challenges too. So therefore, this next phase of globalization should not be let's return to a world where there are no global norms, but there needs to be a revised list of global norms, realizing that there are real differences. So we are moving into a new phase of globalization, globalization 4.0. Right. What would you see as the distinctive elements of this globalization 4.0 compared to the globalization we had until now? In, in fact, you know, you've written are very eloquently in your book about this. And quite frankly, the thing that I've come to recognize is when I look at the world, the last 50 years, we've grown at around three and a half points across the globe. Then any projection, at least I see, for the next 50 years, people say it's going to be a challenge to even grow at the rate with which we were growing. But I'm an optimist because I believe these breakthroughs we just talked about can absolutely help the world grow at that rate, if not faster, right? That Robert Gordon thing where he talks about the 1870 to 1940 period can probably be brought back maybe in 2020 to 2050, 2070. But what will have to be the challenge that we will need to face in globalization 4.0 is that this can't be just economic growth and productivity growth but we need real inclusive growth. Especially, and it's easy to say, but tough to do, because for example, we may have economic growth and productivity growth and a decoupling with wages and jobs. 
And so I think one of the key initiatives that I'm glad we are discussing as a first class issue even in this year's forum is to say what does it mean to have the social structures, the political structures, and the economic structures that support more inclusive growth in every region. Yeah. The other thing that I've also come to realize is every country is going to put their country's interests first. They should. No country should be hollowed out in the middle. Uh, and so therefore, if every country puts its interests first, guess what? We live in one globe. So ultimately, we will have to come back and find the global maxima uh, because the climate is shared, resources are shared, trade, whatever the issues might in the short term, it is not going to go away. That is what has led to economic growth. So I think this globalization 4.0, I've kind of come to the conclusion local action for equity will lead to a global maxima in economic growth and equity. I, I uh, formulate it in such a way we have to keep an open um, multilateral world, That's but right. at the same time we have to put much more emphasis on national social coherence. That's right. Because that provides the stability of uh, well democracy, of society, and so on. Now, um, if I look at uh, Microsoft, I think you, not only the world is uh, transforming and we need a new uh, concept for this transformation, which is uh, globalization 4.0. Um, and I, I just would say it should not only be more um, equitable, more sustainable, but uh, I think it should, and that's the purpose of uh, our meeting here, it should also bring out so that at the end we all, despite differences, share principal values. But um, let me come to another point. When, when I look at Microsoft, Microsoft was con considered to be a supplier of software. Now I would uh, describe your strategy as a catalyst for uh, digitalization. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that every, every company has to become a digital platform or with, uh, how do, what is your advice to the business leaders here who are not platform companies. It's fascinating. I mean, one of the things that is super exciting for me, even the meetings I've been having with a variety of partners of ours, uh, yeah, at the forum even, is to see how this democratic force of digital technology is becoming part of companies everywhere. Right? I mean, here we are in Switzerland. Um, you know, Bueller is a local company that we worked with, and you know, it's it's involved in food production. In fact, 90% of the world's corn goes through these Bueller machines. And guess what? They are using the cutting-edge computer vision technology to find the toxins in the world's corn production before it shows up in sort of food in the shelves of the supermarket. That's the use of digital technology to create their own platform. I was reading recently about how Anna Oza Bush worked with Microsoft to create their own platform for barley. So even agri agriculture, which is the oldest industry that we know of, is being transformed as we speak using digital technology. And they themselves are building their own platforms. So I absolutely think whether it's BMW or whether it is Anna Bush, whether it's Bueller, they're all totally in control of their own destiny using this new factor of production. So that's, I think, by the way, for me, so important. I describe it as tech intensity. Yeah. For example, one of the things that I believe in the fourth industrial revolution is, um, in fact, if I sort of slightly digress, there's this economist out of Dartmouth who did a longitudinal study uh, of diffusion of technology in the previous industrial revolutions. And the simple formula they found was that if you have a country that takes the best innovation, brings it into their country, and then builds on it new innovation, then that's how countries can prosper and companies can prosper. And that's what I see happening. So one way uh, to, to, to take up what you just said is to see the platform of each company as an integrator, not only to provide a product, but to provide social value. Is this correct? That's right, because if you think about it, none of us live in isolation. Uh, in fact, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of make this comment, which comes back to the social value, right? Uh, just two weeks ago, Microsoft, uh, as a very successful company in the Seattle region, 
realize that we have benefited immensely from what is happening in Seattle. And we said, okay, but at the same time, Seattle has a challenge in housing. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we've taken essentially what we have is a strong balance sheet and put it to work to create uh, low income and middle income housing in Seattle so that people who work inside of Microsoft, we're not all software engineers. We also have people who work at Microsoft, who work in our cafeteria, who provide us services in our shuttles. They all work with us, they're proximate with us, they should live with us. And so we said, okay, we need to be able to create the housing that they need so that they don't have the commute burden. So I bring that up mostly to explain that, look, all of us need a thriving society to have a thriving economy. Because without it, uh, there's no way we can somehow grow economically without really a society that works. One yesterday in a, in a different discussion I participated, um, one stumbling block in, in order to go into this direction is the fact that uh, companies um, employ, let's say, MBAs and specialists, but actually if you want to go into this direction of creating a platform uh, for also providing social value, because that's what will be required from each company in the future, you need to hire more uh, sociologists and so on. Uh, do you do it at Microsoft? In fact, it's, it's a fallacy to think that successful tech products are only created because we employ just the technologists. And in fact, what is technology? And it's really interesting. Today, uh, any team at Microsoft, whether it's on our cloud platform or on Xbox, will have the following composition. It'll have designers, and designers can come from sociology, anthropology, and, you know, and design, but a variety of different fields. So design is a first class, I would call, a function of product creation. Data science. Uh, data science itself, also people can come from many different mathematical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. We, of course, have to have product managers who are business people who understand customers and scenarios. And then we have software engineers and hardware engineers and so on. So it's a really a multidisciplinary yeah. world, uh, whether it's a banking product, whether it's a healthcare product, or what is considered a pure digital product. It, in fact, requires the social sciences and the STEM uh, sciences to come together to create, I think, the modern society. So um, it's an appeal to all of uh, the businesses really uh, to integrate as much diversity into the workforce as possible. So that's, I think, what you are doing. Right. I mean, it, and, and, and that's the key. And in fact, one of the things that we have sort of said, look, the business case for diversity is as straightforward as it ever was, it, but it's time to act. And for me, it's sort of, if you want to take my, our mission, we say we want to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. That's who we are at our core. There's no way we're going to achieve that without representing the world. Uh, so that means diversity when it comes to gender, diversity when it comes to ethnicity, diversity when it comes to skills. Uh, all of this is what's, I think, required in our organizations. But one of the key things you brought up is it's not just having the representation. It is how is the culture of your organization, your institution, going to help people who come from diverse backgrounds do their very best work? And that's where the real challenge of inclusion comes in. And that's hard work, but it's got to be the everyday lived experience that you strive for. I, I have, we, we are coming uh, towards an end of our session. Um, I have two uh, questions. Um, one is, if you look at the 10 foremost platform companies, um, they are either American or uh, Chinese. What would you tell uh, the European politicians and business leaders how to catch up? I mean, it's a, I, you know, grew up, in fact, in Microsoft at the same time that SAP, for example, was becoming a very large uh, company out of Europe, and we partnered very deeply. 
Uh, I remember distinctly even the first couple of meetings that Hasso and Bill would have. We were building our first database product, and obviously client server was just being born, and uh, SAP was creating R3, and it was magical at some level. We both were able to co-innovate and create this new world. I think if we sort of started with the aperture that this tech industry as measured by these 10 companies, American and Chinese, is I think the wrong way to think about it. Uh, I think that we should start thinking about what is the comparative advantage of Europe? Uh, take uh, the industrial base in Switzerland, in Germany. They, I mean, my, par my partnerships with all the companies that I work with in the auto industry or in, the, uh, you know, in robotics and many other uh, or pharma companies out of them, uh, out of here, are all becoming digital companies. They are all becoming digital platform companies. They all will prosper in the fourth industrial revolution. So instead of narrowly viewing what is digital, but really going back to the comparative advantage that has always existed in the different parts of the world. This is, applies to Asia, it applies to Africa, it applies to Europe. Uh, that we all can, in fact, build value add that ultimately helps the world drive economic growth. So you could say um, it's like electricity. Um, correct. You are delivering the electricity, but what really counts is what people afterwards do. That is exactly correct. And the, one of the great advantages in 2019 versus even, say, the industrial revolutions of the past is technology that is developed in any part of the world very quickly gets diffused to all parts of the world. So we don't have to have, I would call it, industrial competition or country over country competition of the previous decades and the previous centuries inform how regions work and regions prosper. I think that's where we're trying to use too much of our history to project forward. I don't think 100 years from now we're going to be sitting around and talking about our regional differences. We're going to be talking about what is that global cooperation that is required in order to solve our pressing challenges. I would, I would just what you said, uh, uh, if we look in 100 years from now, maybe in 50 years from now, when we are at the, uh, let's say, when we are at the, maybe in the transition to the um, four, fifth industrial revolution. Yeah. Do you think then um, uh, robots will sit here <laughs> and, and will discuss what they do, what they will do in the future with human beings? <laughs> you know, I, here's my take on it. My take on it is you and I uh, may not be alive, but that said, if we were sitting here, we would have more superpowers because of computing being embedded in our worlds. And I hope that one of the things that we will have as human beings is more capacity for the most human qualities in us, which is empathy for the other human beings. So I hope that that's the future as opposed to us being replaced by robots. That's a very great ending, and I, 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 I would say it provided us with a great insight into a company, um, and it shows that the leader of this company um, has not only his business in mind, but um, uh, is uh, socially engaged and a true visionary. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, for this unique opportunity thank and you so a much. discussion with you. And I would... Thank you. Um, and I'm personally... Um, by the way, I'm not making promotions. The proceeds, <laughs> the proceeds go to the World Economic Forum. Um, but um, I had the pleasure to write this book on, so it's the second book uh, after having conceptualized the fourth industrial revolution. And here I describe how uh, shaping the fourth industrial revolution, how it should be remain human centered. And I'm very proud that uh, Satya Nadella um, wrote the um, foreword. And um, so I uh, hand over this book for him to him for uh, Satya Nadella, a pioneer of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, with admiration and best services. Uh, Thank, you best so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.